It's uh, having a great conference. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm loving it. Great to be back in Brazil and great to be together. I have to say I was most inspired by the, what did they call it, fishbowl yesterday <laughs> with all the chairs um, because I could hear the translation and the passion that people have for what they're doing and like, is this all about money? I, I, it, was, it was just very philosophical and uh, inspiring at the same time. So uh, it was very, very nice to hear. Thank you so much. My name is Bruce Momjin. I work for EDB. Been working there for 16 years. Been working at Postgres for 26 years. I love this talk. And the reason I love this talk is because I think it highlights a lot of the innovation that Postgres has had over the years. I talked um, yesterday about some of the challenges to the project. Uh, but one of the real bright spots, and I think the thing that's going to continue to propelling Postgres forward, is innovation. Uh, you know, a lot of people choose open source to save money, but if you go back two years later and you ask them, what is the major benefit to open source to you? It won't be money. It'll be innovation. So that's kind of surprising, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The slides, again, are at the same URL. Uh, I challenge to see if anyone can use this or not from the distance you are. <laughs> I don't think so. Someone had a huge one up there and I could use it, but I don't know if you can use something that small. Anyway, feel free to walk up there or put my name in a search engine or something. Uh, but again, these slides are uh, online and um, feel free to study them. Somebody said that you, once you watch me, you have to kind of go back and, and look again <laughs> because there's so much detail in there. So uh, we are going to talk about non-relational Postgres. And to talk about non-relational Postgres, we have to talk about relational Postgres. What is relational? We talked about this yesterday, didn't we? Remember I said that I was nine years old when EF COD <laughs> just created SQL? Sounds crazy. Um, but it's true. 1970, still in use. And we talked yesterday about how this, how... SQL has innovated beyond the, the original requirements in 1970 and it continues to improve. And that's, I think Postgres is benefiting from that. And to some extent, Postgres is driving that. Some of the, some of the innovation in the SQL standards is actually copying things Postgres has done. Never thought that would happen, but we're that big now that they see what Postgres is doing and say, oh, that should be part of the standard. Um, but relational systems are incredibly flexible, as we said yesterday, but they're not always ideal. How many of you studied databases in uh, university or books? Probably a lot of you. And you know, you learn, thank you, you learn a very, I'm realizing there's a little delay on the translation. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's ladies for the translation. We really appreciate that. It is a huge win for me and for the audience. So thank you. Uh, everywhere I go, I thank my translators. It is critical what you do. Um, so uh, basically, if you studied relational theory, there's all this second normal form, third normal form. Uh, what is it? There's a third normal NF, I, there's, there's some categories of that. Um, and in the, in, the, in the theoretical world, it makes sense, but, but there, there are practical requirements. And practical requirements don't always match the, the, the theory, right? So relational storage basically says in, in its paper, and again, there's a lot of this blue text down here. So if you use the download the PDF, you can just click on that and it'll take you right to that article. Um, so in relational theory, you have rows and columns and, and tables, and these are the sort of theory, uh, the academic terms for them. Um, there are constraints, but there's also this requirement called normalization, and we've talked about a little bit about that, third normal form, th fourth normal form, and it means that you, have, you can't join data together, and specifically, the normalization means each column can only t contain one atomic value. And you can't have repeated groups uh, in a table. And you have to set it for each relational set. 
Uh, and everything has to have a primary key. And again, these are wonderful guides. But what I'm going to show you today is to eight, over eight examples where relational theory is better off, where Postgres is better off not following this. And I'm going to try and sort of hone in on why that is practically, because I grew up with relational theory. That's how we structured things. But when I look now, I had to evolve to understand where relational theory was limiting my thought and where the non-relational parts, when necessary, were incredibly useful. Okay, that's, what we're, that's going to be our goal today. When would you not want to use first normal form, which is the kind of the basis of relational theory? So there are cases where query performance, you may not want to use uh, normalized form. Uh, query complexity, as you kind of spread out your data, can be very complex to pull data together. Storage and flexibility, okay? Um, storage overhead and indexing limitations. We're going to cover some of these as we go, but the point is that even in the Postgres system tables, we have non-relational structures, okay? So we're a relational database, yet we are using non-relational storage all the way from Berkeley, from 36 years ago, we're still using, we have non-relational aspects of our system tables. Why? Because of query complexity, index limitations, query performance. Those system tables have to be very fast. We couldn't use relational theory in those cases. Okay? So again, really interesting when you don't want to use it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover eight different data types that Postgres supports today which I would categorize as non-relational, all right? I'm sure many of you have seen some of these, but you've probably not seen all of them, and you've probably never understood them together, and you've probably also not understood why they're so powerful, okay? So you might have heard of JSON. You know we have text types. You probably may have heard of arrays, but why are they useful? What is it about Postgres that sort of supersedes the traditional relational structures. And I would argue that people come to Postgres for relational, but in many ways they get excited about Postgres, and Postgres becomes a, a foundation because of this non-relational part, okay? So let's, let's start with the first one. This is arrays. I, I alluded that the system tables back in the Berkeley days used non-relational structures. It turns out it arrays are the one feature that we have in the system tables which are non-relational. The reason the system tables have arrays is because we have to specify permissions for various objects. Those permissions can be one, two, three, or more elements. Could we have done a join to another system table? Yes. Would it have slowed Postgres down? Yes. Would, did we decide to do it? No. We decided, let's just put all the permissions together up against each other in a single column, and therefore our backend code will be simpler, the Postgres will be faster, it'll be easier to query. Okay, so there's an example where we have a practical use in the system tables to use non-relational structures. So you can use them yourself anytime you create for any data type you have. If you put brackets after it, it identifies it as an array. In fact, you can put a number in there, the number doesn't matter. <laughs> it's there for notation only. You can store as many elements as you want. So here I'm creating what I'm gonna call a text array. Um, you can see here that we have one, two, three elements in the text array. So I've created an employee called, uh, a table called employee with a certification column that's an array. Yeah, I could have put it in another table, but you know, it's just certifications. I don't want to validate it. I don't want to do a join. Let's just put them in there, right? It's not that important to me. Um, so here I'm creating an employee called Bill, and I'm I'm specifying three different um, three different uh, certifications for that employee. As you can see, if I do a select, I actually get the certifications. And the reason I know it's an array, it's got little brackets on either side which tells me I'm an array. And what's also kind of interesting, and you're going to see this over and over 
and over again in this talk is that you can do really nice lookups using syntax. So there's this thing called the containment operator. We're going to see this repeatedly. And I can say, give me the employee where their array contains that certification. Kind of cool, right? Works really well. Um, by the way, if you, if you love this, this presentation so much that you want to see the queries again, <laughs> um, feel free to download the actual SQL and run it in your browser, in your, in your PSQL session. So you can actually just look at all the queries straight off. That's how I wrote this presentation. Just take the SQL, run it, and you're, you can see the whole, you're not going to see the colors, but you'll see all the SQL. Okay. Um, you can access individual elements of the array. So the elements are actually indexed with um, starting at one. So that's the first uh, is certification for this employee. I have an unnest command, which will take an array and convert it to rows, right? It's kind of rolling it downward. Um, I also have an unnest, uh, so I can, I can kind of do it that way in the target list. I also have um, something called array ag, and that will take rows and roll them up into an array, right? So, so unnest goes down and array ag goes up in a way, right? It's, I'm, this is actually a system table right here, and I'm just saying give me an array of the unique system table identifiers, or in this case, the rel kinds. Uh, this may be an old query, but you get the idea, okay? Any questions? Okay. Um, okay. Number two, range types. <clears throat> now, this is one that got me, we got this probably 15 years ago, and when somebody described it to me, I was like, really? Like, is that really useful? How many of you have had to write queries where you have some kind of start date and stop date, right? Yeah, like everybody, like every application has this start, stop. Uh, Pavel, you're going to be talking about it next, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to zoom over this section because you're going to cover it, right? Um, so Pavel's going to be talking about some really interesting scheduling stuff. Do you actually use this in the talk, Pavel? You could. Okay, you could. All right. So what's really – so what the, what's the range type does is it gives me a start and a stop, right? Normally, in relational theory, you'd have a start column and you'd have a stop column, right? I mean, that's the way we always did it. But, you know, I remembered something when somebody talked to me about this. And I, I said, I don't get it. I don't understand why taking a start and a stop column and putting them in the same as a single field would be useful. Why don't we just keep separate columns? But then I remembered that when you do a query on a start and a stop column, it's really hard to index it, right? Because you create an index on the start and you create an index on the stop, but it's kind of like if you're looking for something in a certain date, the indexes aren't kind of hooked together, right? So you have to find all the rows that have a date over something and then all the ones that have an under and then you find the overlap, right? particularly for a B tree. What's really cool about this is because you put the columns together in the same field, you can index the field as a unit. And that's where the power comes. Let's, let's take a look at this. First, we create, in this case, a timestamp with time zone range. So if you're familiar with timestamp with time zone, this is pretty classic. Um, then we actually insert a car rental record here. This is the start time, and this is the stop time, okay? Um, I can do a query right here with the containment operator, right, again, um, where I say, give me the car rental that has this time between the start and the stop, okay? Makes sense, kind of nice, kind of easier than saying greater than start and less than stop, right? Um, I can do it here, and you can see no rows are returned, so it, it works, okay? Um, but here's, here's where it gets really interesting. I just went ahead and created like 3,000, 3,600 3, car rental records, okay? 
using generate series. It's just like for every day in a 10 year span, just give me, give me all these records. Okay. So if I go and I say, okay, give me the car rental that, that has this between the start and the stop, it works. Okay. But if you were here in the talk earlier about explain, you know what a sequential scan is, right? And you can notice that the system is actually doing a sequential scan right now to find the record that's in that range. Now, if the table's small, that's not a problem. If the table has a million rows, that's a problem, okay? Um, unless you're doing some kind of data analytics and you expect to query all the rows, right? If you're doing looking for a single row and you've got to go through millions or potentially billions to find it, not good. If you used a B tree, still not great because you're, you're remember you're processing a lot of rows to say greater than and less than, right? So here's where the real magic comes, and this you're going to see this over and over again in this talk. The, the non-relational parts of Postgres are good, but without the specialized indexing that Postgres has, it wouldn't be useful in production. There's a lot of databases that sort of say, oh, we have a data type here, and oh, we have a data type there. That's wonderful, and you can do proof of concepts with those sort of simplistic data types all you want, but unless you have sophisticated indexing beyond B-tree, beyond hash, to actually query millions or billions of rows with these custom data types, you're, they're not going to be very useful. And you're going to see this over and over again in this talk about how indexing is a key aspect. So in this case, I'm going to create a specialized index called GIST, which is specially designed for range types. And when I now do my explain, you can see it actually uses that specialized index. Okay, so I'm now able to zoom right to the row incredibly quickly, partially because I have the just index and partially because the two columns are in the same field, so the index can index the field very cleanly. That makes sense? Okay. There's another cool thing about this. I'm not sure how many of you have thought of it, but Suppose you have a car rental company and you don't want any overlapping car rentals because nobody can rent, no two people can rent the same car, right, at the same time. There's a problem in doing that because if two people try and reserve the same car for the same time and there's, it's not currently reserved, it's potentially possible somebody could reserve it while you look, is that, is that record available? Is that time available? You go to insert. Somebody else could be doing something the exact same time. Is that available? Can I insert? And they both say, oh, it's available, and they both insert. Now, if, you're, if you have a unique index, you might be able to avoid that. But th that doesn't work for range type, remember, because the start and stop could be different. Like it could be the first person could rent it for 12 hours and the second person for six hours and they might overlap, but they aren't the same. They aren't, they aren't unique, right? But they overlap. What's really cool about this is that with this gist index, you can do something called an exclusion constraint. You may have seen that in the Postgres docs. You may have had no idea what it was for, right? I was like, what, in this, what is this exclusion constraint? What it actually does is this is the overlap operator, and it says prevent overlaps in this table. And you can see if I try and add a record, I get an exclusion error right there. Very hard to do this without doing it in the database with a specialized index. I don't know how else you would do it. If you do it in the application, you potentially have to lock the table, the whole table, or range of value. I don't know how you would do it. It's like, how would you prevent this? All right. So I think that's incredibly powerful. Any questions? Okay, great. Okay. Geometry. Um, this is a case where we're putting an X and a Y value. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't see your hand. I'm sorry. Hi. Hey. Uh Will it be any error if you try to add this index? If you already has a overlapping 
value. Yeah, if you try and create this index when the data is already overlapping, you'll get an error in the index creation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Good, good just, question. Just yeah. Sure. So, oh, one of the, any other questions in case I miss a hand here? Okay, good. Um, oh, Pavel, yes, please. Pavel, right up there. Can we emulate the exclusion constraint using the check constraint? So can we, um, so the only, no, because the check constraint really can only use constants. You can't do a query in the check constraint, right? So depending on what values you are adding, it's hard to understand what your check constraint would look like because it's really, you have to compare it against a dynamic table, right? I assume if we allowed subqueries in the check constraint, we could do it, I think. I think that might work, but it would be pretty, <laughs> pretty ugly. Um, this is a much more efficient way as well. Um, I don't think check constraints would work because I think, I love check constraints, I won't talk about it, but I think it's too limited, yeah in terms of its dynamic ability, yeah, okay. Um, let's take a look at geometry. This is a similar case where we're putting, an, instead of putting a start and a stop value in a field, we're gonna put an X and a Y value in, right? Um, also consider this could be longitude and latitude. So those of you who are familiar with post-GIS, this is the same fundamental technology that's used for GIS, instead of being X, Y coordinates, it's longitude, latitude, okay? And there's a huge amount more, but you get the idea. So what we basically do is we have a, a created table called dartboard or dart, and we put a point in there, and then we generate 1,000 random darts into the board. And they're so random that they're effectively randomly distributed across the board. So they're not even trying to hit the center. It's just random shots at this board. Uh, and you can see this is what it looks like. Here's my X and here's my Y, okay? So what can we do with that? Well, containment operator to the rescue. We can create a circle with radius four and say, give me all of the darts that are within four units of the center of the dartboard, right? So I'm basically saying, Take a circle at 50-50, which is the center, give it a radius of four, cast it as a circle, and tell me what location's contained in that circle. You can see this containment thing is starting to go like crazy. It's, it, there's more coming, all right? Um, but I was shocked at how, how consistent we were. Right? I mean, because all these features developed by all these different people, but because we've got very eagle-eyed developers who are like, oh, you should use the containment operator here you know, when you're developing the feature. Somebody's talking to somebody, um, and you're going to see at the end all the containment operators. It's crazy. But it's a great example of the use of the containment operator, right? Um, and, but, but, but there's a problem, and again, we're, this is the same flow that we have. There's a problem. We're doing a sequential scan. I already said we don't want to necessarily do a sequential scan. We may have... 10 million darts, uh, darts on the board. So we actually can, can create, again, a gist index. And when I do that, and I ask for something in the circle, it knows, it knows how to do that. All right, it knows to use the index for a circle that we've created and index all the darts that are in that circle. Crazy. I do have another talk about Postgres indexing methods, and it does talk about GIST and GIN and some of these other methods. So if you're curious about what GIST is and what GIN is, I recommend you go back to my website, and it's called, I think, Flexible Indexing with Postgres, and it goes through the various indexing types. In fact, often I give this talk with the indexing talk together, but we don't have time today, so we're just going to do this one. But that's not all, okay? There's, there's, another, there's another issue. Um, and the issue is sometimes you don't want all the darts within a certain 
distance from the center, you want like the certain you want a certain number. I'm sorry, translators. Uh, you want a certain number of close darts, right? So instead of having a circle and limiting all the darts in the circle, I want the cl two closest darts to the center. Okay, how do you do that as an application developer? Well, you think, well, I guess I could create like a box or a circle and you have a radius two and see how many darts I get. And if I get two or more, I can just order the darts and pick the two closest ones, right? But what if there's not two darts? What if there's zero darts or one dart? Well, then I'm going to make the tape circle bigger. I'm going to try again. What if it still doesn't work? I'm going to make the table bigger. So you've got this application problem where you have to effectively make the circle bigger <laughs> to get the closest. And this is a problem that happens all the time. You may not deal with this, but GIS has to deal with it all the time. Um, I can't tell you how many Postgres talks I've been to where the example is, give me the closest, um, the closest bar to the event. Um, that is a very common example. I've seen it over and over again. Yes, yeah, some people are clapping. Um, but you can see how that would be a problem. Now, we can go through all the darts and get all the distances and then sort them all and get the closest one. But that's going to be, what if we have millions of, millions of, of, of darts or millions of bars, right? That's not going to work. So you've got all these hacks that people typically have to do. What's really interesting with Postgres is you use the same query, but instead of using a circle, use a point, and you use what's called the distance operator. Now, distance operator looks like a spaceship. Any of you ever use like ASCII spaceships? That's what it looks like um, for those who, were, who didn't have graphics. Um, but it's this little operator here. It's a distance. And you're saying, order it by, this is, this is crazy that this works. You can thank our Russian developers for this. Um, you can say, order by the distance and limit it to the two closest ones. And what's crazy about it is not only does it work, but it uses the index we created earlier. Right? That's called a nearest neighbor search in, in academia. It's a nearest neighbor search, and it's using an index on a nearest neighbor search. We've had this for 12, 14 years or something like that. Um, but it is amazingly powerful that that works. And you can imagine if you're doing something like a GIS, this is, this is a game changer. This is absolutely very important. Any questions? OK. Yeah, sir. So the distance operator, you want to know what that number is? I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. In full text search, we put um, a number you know, instead of the iPhone. Oh, full text and, search? Yeah. But, but, I'm, I'm getting the full text search. Yeah, but here you cannot do the same. No, no. no. Yeah, yeah. Because in full text search, you, you talk about the number of words away it is, yeah, but that's yeah, not, yes, we don't yeah. do that here. Yeah. yeah, good question. Very sophisticated question there. <laughs> other, other questions? Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about XML really quickly because, again, XML is a case where we originally had XML databases. It was very popular years ago. JSON, and I would say JSONB has pretty much superseded that, but we do have an XML type. You can basically create an XML document. You can do things, things like XPath queries. Here's my XPath query in red right here. Basically, whatever's in red is where you should look if you haven't figured that out. Um, you can do arrays. You can convert them to text. You can, um, you can order them. And then you can even do uh, non-root queries. In this case, this is uh, printers. Uh, you can use unnest. Remember, we talked about that already, the unnest from the arrays. Uh, and I can even say, give me the HP printers uh, that are in that XML document. I know it's kind of weird, but you kind of get, if you're an XML person, this makes a lot of sense. Okay? Any questions about XML? Okay. All right. So let's get to the, let's get to the two that I think are going to be most interesting, JSON and JSONB. I, uh, we do have two JSON data types. Um, there's a good reason for that. 
uh, the JSON data type that we're looking at here is really just a text document, right? So there's no there's no processing, there's no compression, there's no tokenization. It's just an XML document. And if you just want to load XML, I'm sorry, it's just a JSON document. If you just want to load JSON into Postgres and take it out, this is your data type, okay? So JSON is uh, basically just a data type. It's, it's, an, it's like XML, it's just stored and validated. There's 100 JSON functions you can use. So here's an example. I basically create a JSON column. I loaded it in. Um, I can pretty print my JSON if I want. Um, I can access individual elements of the JSON using this operator, okay? With the double greater than or sing single greater than. Um, I can concatenate them together. Um, I can even, um, you know, do containment on it. Right? Containment again. So I'm basically saying here's a key and a value. Give me the documents that contain that key and value. Same, do same thing, right? Um, I can create indexes on them, but the indexing is limited, and I'll show you why later. Basically, here's an index, but it's only on one key. Right? And it's a B tree index. So it's an index on one key. That may be sufficient. That may not be, depending on what type of document you have. You can see it uses the index. Here's, a, here's an index, um, here's an example of, of using uh, INET, so you can convert something to an um, IP address, IP block. I can even do uh, uh, aggregates on my JSON, okay. But again, JSON was great if you're just putting the document in and out, but JSON B is where really things get exciting because the JSON is internally processed into Postgres, it's compressed, it's sorted, the keys are sorted, so it's incredibly fast to look things up and to do internal processing of JSON documents inside of the database, all right? Um, a couple things to be aware of. First, uh, it understands the standard, what is that, one, two, three, four, five JSON data types. Um, it index, what's really interesting to me is that instead of indexing one JSON key, you can index all of them at once. No matter what they are, they get indexed in one index. Incredibly powerful. Um, they are compressed. Um, it does. It sorts them in binary for binary search. It does not preserve the order of the keys. So if you need, you know, if you want your document to look the same going in and out, don't use JSONB. All right. Um, it doesn't preserve white space and it removes duplicates. It makes only one duplicate. <laughs> So here's an example of the differences. For example, notice I have two names in this document, and this is JSON, but if I convert it to JSONB, you can see that the, the, the single name has been removed. The age is now first before the name, and also some of the spacing around the colon is gone, right? You can see the processing just by looking at it, all right? Uh, Let's load in some data here. I'm going to create a column called JSONB. I'm going to insert into it. And now I'm going to create an index. But instead of indexing a single key, I just throw the whole column at the index. All right? And what's really cool is now if I do a containment on the key last name, it uses the index. If I do an example on the first name, it uses the index. If I do it on the IP address, it uses the same index, all right? So that's super cool that effectively it is an index on everything in the document. So if you're an application developer, and you may know, no, no, well, I don't know what columns to index. Well, just create, <laughs> create a JSON, just create an index on the whole thing. Um, it, it, it's very, very efficient. Any questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, I've seen on, uh, hackers uh, that will have a standardized of JSON and JSONB in the next versions. I don't know where. Uh, is that correct? JSON will be, JSONB will be the same on version 16 or 17, or I don't know. I, I have not, I have not heard that. Um, I really, 
I think the reason we have the two types is because there are people that just want to store validated JSON in the database, uh, similar to what we do with XML. So I don't think that type is going away. I guess we could, I guess we could have like a flag, and have, you know, yeah. you know how we have var car and we have a, a number after yeah. it. That's exactly this the, 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 this problem because the SQL standard says you have you must have a, a JSON, uh, not a JSON and JSON B, uh, right? So to follow this the SQL standards should be a, this, just one. You have a good point there. I have not seen the discussion, but I can see why we'd have to do that. Yeah, this is a great example because Postgres had JSON pretty much before anyone else relationally. So they kind of took a lot of what we did, but then they changed it a little bit. And yeah, I, you're probably right. We're probably going to need to, but that, you know, actually that's not a huge problem because for example, we have int and integer. It's the same. We actually have int, int for an integer and they're all integer, right? So I'd probably have to do the same thing here where JSON, JSONB would be the same thing. And we'd probably have to have parentheses after it to indicate whether you want the binary version or the, yeah. We, my guess is we default to the binary now, and then if you want the text, you'd put a T in there. Or, yeah, that would work. Yeah, good point. I don't, I haven't seen the patches, but there's no reason we couldn't do that. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is the seventh one. This, is, this one's kind of weird. I'm gonna, you know, like it hasn't been weird enough. Uh, this one is uh, basically taking a row and putting it in a column, right? Taking a row and putting it in a column, or putting it in a field, single value, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm creating something called a driver's license, and I have the state, um, and I have the actual number, and I have a valid data. And then I create a table called truck driver, where I have an ID, a person, the person's name, and then for the third column, it's this row. <laughs> right. Now, there is, there, is some, there is some logic to this, because in the United States, the, the number of the driver's license is not unique across states. So I have a number, and somebody else in another state might have my same number, but only I have that number in Pennsylvania, right? So in a way, the, the number and the state are kind of together, right? The valid until, yeah, I, I just threw that in there. Um, but what's really interesting is I can now in, create a truck driver, and I can actually, with parentheses, insert a row into that license field, okay? Um, and I can query it, I can actually do a select, and I can see the license right here. Um, you, you, can, you can actually query just the column. I can even pull out a, a, a field in the row that's in the column, right? So I'm saying, for the license column, give me the state field in the row that's in the column, kind of, okay? And in this case, it's Pennsylvania or PA, all right? Um, the reason this is useful um, is you see this a lot with triggers. So if you're writing a trigger, you can define a, 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 a field that is actually a row, and you address it this way. So this concept of actually putting a row inside of a, of a single field actually has use, usefulness. Also, if you're doing logging, you could just log the whole row into one of your columns, right? And just plop it in there. You don't have to predefine it. You just kind of like, psh, like I know it's gonna, let's suppose I know it's coming from the, the driver's license table, then I can just create a driver's license column, just I know it's gonna match, okay? Kind of cool, okay. This is the last one, and this is a grab bag. Like, uh, let me see how I can explain this. So, I'm not sure how many of you have thought of it, but we deal as engineers with text fields all the time, right? 
Like, you know, okay, somebody's got a name, somebody's got a, a, a document, somebody's got a code, somebody's got, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, a nickname, right? And you think of all these text fields that we deal with all the time, right? And what is a text field? Well, at the computer level, the text field is really just a stream of characters, right? So we get that. But sometimes we want to look at that stream of characters as words. Sometimes, right? And sometimes we want to look at the stream of characters as maybe groups of letters, right? And sometimes we just want to look at the whole string together. We don't care about the letters individually. It's a code. I don't care if A is first and F is second. I just need the code to match or not match. So my point is that although we think of uh, character strings as like a string of characters, we uh, operationally, we sometimes have to think of them in different ways. And we're going to do that right now. So here we have uh, a fortune table and we have a text field. Just standard text. We're just going to load it in. All right. So here I actually have um, a particular uh, case where I have underdog in one, of the, in one of the fortunes, let's say. But you're going to notice that if I use a lowercase, I don't get it. So again, our whole concept of a string of characters is, is starting to fall apart already. Because it's not really the character we're worried about, it's the alphabetic letter we're worried about, which can be upper or lowercase. Or can have an accent on it, right? Which we're not even gonna go there, but you get the point. So what's interesting is that I can actually do this kind of query, and that maps all of my characters down to a uniform underscore, and I can do that, okay? Um, but the problem is if I create an index on the field, my text field, okay, and I do a sequential, I do, an, I do a query, it doesn't use the index because the index only knows about characters. It doesn't know about alphabetic characters. So I can actually create something called an expression index. Maybe if some of you have seen this, my flexible indexing with Postgres talks about this. This is the ability to index not a field, a column, but a function call on a column or an expression on a column. So what we've done here is we've done explain, and now I just have to put the word underdog and it finds it right away with my index. Upper or lowercase doesn't, I, well actually I have to put it in lowercase so it matches because I've only indexed everything as lowercase, okay? Um, what if I'm looking for a prefix? I wanna know all the strings that begin with a certain set of characters, okay? Um, I got two right here, uh, but if I try and use that index I created before, oddly it can't do it. And the reason it can't do it is related to some of the, of the complexity related to um, different character encodings. So we have a special way of doing that um, called text pattern ops. And I'm, I've given you a little comment here. Um, but this is a special way of creating an index with a modifier, I guess similar to the modifier we're gonna have to use for JSON someday, right? Um, with a modifier, and now when I do my query, it automatically can get the prefixes properly uh, using, using that, okay? okay. Um, what if I want to get a lower of, of the beginning letters? Uh, that doesn't work. Even though we already have two indexes, it doesn't work. So we're going to create a third index, which is going to be lower of the line, and then the text pattern ops with it. And now we're using we're using an index for the query. You can kind of see how we're we're kind of we were getting farther away from from what I originally talked about. We're starting to see lowercase and now the prefixing, right? It's not as simple as we might want it to be. And we haven't even, we, have, we still have like four more net indexes to go. Okay. Full text search. Remember I said, sometimes you don't want to think of things as characters, but you want to think of them as words. Full text search thankfully helps with that. It allows whole words and word prefixes to be done. This was done, I don't know, 2000, four or five, something like this. Been around for a long time. Um, 
it supports and, or, or not. Uh, it converts the words basically to something called lexemes. And the reason that's interesting is that it actually does stemming on the words. So it will remove plurals. It will remove uh, word endings for verbs, for example. Um, and it will do this in many languages. Armenian, I happen to be Armenian. That was added, I think, in Postgres 14. I was really excited. It's the first time I saw Armenian stemming uh, with the language. But we support 21 languages. I am sure Portuguese is in there. Uh, but what's really great is it will match things that may not have exact text matches because the index is stored with the stems removed. All right. You can also remove stop words. You can do things with synonyms. Very, very powerful. Uh, here's an example. I'm going to use English. Here you can see that the word I can hardly wait gets removed down to hard and wait. That's because I and can are stop words and hardly stems to hard. Kind of cool. Um, and I can even create a query for those two words. Here I can actually say, um, is it true that I can hardly wait matches hardly and wait? Yes. But does it match softly and wait? No. It doesn't match. I can create a specialized index for full text search. This is what the gentleman was talking about earlier. We're going to use something called GIN, which is a different type of index, not GIST, but GIN. And we're going to call it, we're going to do it in English and we're going to do it on that field. And now I can say, give me all of the entries that have the word pandas. And you can see a giant panda bear. Now there's not, it's not pandas, but again, the stemming happens on the text we index and on the text we supply and that matches. Um, same thing here. If I actually do that query, it uses that specialized. Gin, gin index automatically for that. I can do some fancy stuff. I can say I want cat and sleep. I have cat and sleep in this uh, line right here. I can do cat and sleep or nap. And I actually get napping down here as a match. <laughs> it's, it's pretty sophisticated, right? Um, I can do prefix searches so I can find all of the words that begin with zip. So zip, zips, zippo, um, zippos all are actually uh, found in that query. Uh, and I can even, and, and the index, does, it uses an index, right? Okay. Now, you might be thinking, wow, that's pretty cool. I can do all that stuff. But what if I'm looking for groups of letters? So I don't actually know the word, or I think I know the word, or I might spell it weird. You, you, get, you get what I'm saying, okay? So we have something called, um, we have a special option for that too. Uh, here, for example, if I look for the word, I, if I do an I like query on Verit, it finds all of the cases where the V, the letters V-E-R-I-T appear, okay? But as you're not surprised, the index cannot be used for that, <laughs> okay? Because again, when you're indexing whole words, you're literally indexing by word. We're not looking inside the word and necessarily indexing those. So um, we do have something called PG trigram. It's an extension that comes with Postgres. And we can create a special DIN index on that using a special uh, specifier. And what effectively happens is that when I do my query now, I get the same results. But the big difference is I now get an index scan on my trigram example. What trigram effectively does is uh, break up all the words by threes. Trigram, right? And it basically slices the words three letters at a time and indexes every one of those combinations of three. Right? Very, very powerful. We can also do uh, prefix searches with, uh, with this trigram. So I can say something begins with zip. I get that. Uh, and you can see it actually uses the trigram index. It prefers the trigram index for prefixes for whatever reason. I'm not sure why, but it does. Okay. 
Uh, I can also do similarity with the trigrams. So if you've ever had to do a similar search, yes, we also support things like SoundX and Metaphone and so forth. But if you want to do um, similarity, you can actually set a similarity limit to your query. This is the default. And I can say, give me lines that are similar to so much for the plan. And <laughs> it finds these matches. Uh, it thinks plastic is similar to plan. Uh, I guess it kind of is there. I guess the A is kind of similar. So you, you see what I'm saying? It, it kind of, it's like, ooh, this kind of looks right. I don't, the words don't match, but it's, I have to fix this A. This should be red. Um, but you get, you get the idea. Um, actually, the that, let me see. That, I'm not sure how the, that got in there. No, it doesn't match the that. It just matches the plastic, I think. But you get you get the idea. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. And again, if I increase my similarity, I get I get fewer matches. And I, you know, you can control that to see how 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 tightly it returns results. Okay. And you can see it does use an index for these similarity searches, which is kind of great. Right? It's not having to go through the whole table. It's actually pulling out the trigrams that match what you supplied and kind of giving you the similar strings to that. Uh, but we do have these other options. But again, I don't think we can index those as well as, as kind of this. This is much more sophisticated than those. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Our TS vector example. Uh, it's not more efficient if you create a column TS vector and uh, an index there and use TS query. So you're 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 kind of right. We've had I've seen this debate back and forth. Um, the issue is if you create. I think the issue is that if you create a TS vector column, then the in, and then you index that column, it's really going to be an index of what you're already storing on disk. So why would you also store it in the heap and the index if we can just create the index anyway? Yeah. Um, I've seen people do TS queries. I don't know this this area as well. The Russians kind of developed this and they had a reason for having the ability to create TS vector columns, but but in a lot of ways, I think the TS vector column is just a data type that we use to support functions that take yeah. TS vectors. I don't necessarily think that we're, we're encouraging people to create TS vector columns unless they have a really good reason to do that. Okay. And I, you can check on the hackers list. Pavel maybe has an opinion on this, but or somebody... We have somebody who does more with this than I do. Th that's been my impression. I struggle with that as well. And I think I kind of played with some of the wording to kind of uh, in the docs to kind of say, you know, you probably don't want to do it twice. <laughs> just just index it and be done with it. Good question, though. Other questions? OK, great. OK. so. Um, these are the indexes that I created just in this last section, okay? <laughs> um, so we have the line, the lower, the, the text stops, the lower and the text stops, the TS vector, and then the trigram, all right? So you can kind of see, I know this section eight is complicated, but you can kind of see how we kind of worked our way down. Uh, this, these are all the containment operators. And the ones in red are the ones I showed you, and the ones that aren't in red, I didn't show you. Okay, But I'm very happy to see how consistent we are with that containment concept here. Okay. And finally, a word of warning. Um, relational systems are great because they think keeps things structured, and you can sort of manipulate them and look at your data all sorts of different ways. I would discourage people from using non-relational concepts unless they really are sure they need them because your data can get a little unstructured from this. Um, so <laughs> I can imagine somebody saying, I'm just going to throw everything in a JSON document or I'm just going to use full text search for my order entry, right? Um, I, 
I would discourage that because you might end up like this this uh, squirrel here where things are just not clear. I think the non-relational is incredibly powerful and it gives us opportunities to do stuff that we really can't do easily other places. But try not to get carried away and sort of use them in cases where they don't make sense because if they don't, they could, over time, you lose structure to your data and it becomes harder to manage. Makes sense. I will take one, maybe two questions, and then I'm done. Although I've taken questions, so let's see if anybody has a question, actually. Yes, sir. Hi. Great, great presentation. Um, we saw yesterday a session about graph. And we was talking about how to access the data, to go from one node to another, to vertices and edges. And what are the optimizations we have to improve this? And we need indexes, or the the basics of the graph you don't need the index because it's just points to one node to other. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to ask you that. I'll ask that after the talk because it, it doesn't kind of cover what I'm doing here. Um, I think I actually, I'm actually out of time and we have our great speaker, Pavel, coming up. So um, I thank you for everything. I love the fact we were able to make it interactive and you were able to ask questions as we went. If you have any further questions, I'll be around. Feel free to ask. Thank you very much.